You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dille and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And I'm here, of course, with Shekhan Delhi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shekhan Delhi, and I'm joining you from uh, Kelowna, which is on the ancestral unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan nations. And... Um, Claudia, we have a very important guest today. I am so thrilled. So we have Dame Professor Dame Sue Black phoning in live from Edinburgh. Welcome to Body Banter. That's, that's very kind of you. I'm not in Edinburgh. I'm in Lancaster. Oh. So I'm oh, in Lancaster. Dear. <laughs> that's okay. That's not a problem. Lancaster is um, the heartland of the UK in that it is the sovereign city. When we had the, the War of the Roses, um, ours was the side that won, so ours is the direct line to the sovereign house. So it's a really important place, Lancaster. It's also the geographical centre of the UK. So whilst people think we're in the north, we're actually not. We're right in the middle. So heartland of the UK, and such a pleasure to join you. Well, welcome, and um, I put you right into Scotland. There you go. So uh, well, thank you, you for rectifying. Right. I, I was born there, and I was brought up there. And I just moved slightly south, but I, I finished in Lancaster at the end of July and I move even further south. So I'm taking up the role of president of St. John's College in Oxford um, at the start of September. So whilst my head and my heart want to head north, home to Scotland, my feet aren't listening. They keep going south. So I have to obviously have words with that bit of my anatomy because it's just not doing what I, I think it should be doing. That's great. Well, it would be a wonderful opportunity for you to be in Oxford. The students are so lucky to have you there. Um, that sounds great. So you've done so much work in anatomy. You're uh, one of the biggest names, I would say, in, in sort of the English speaking world when it comes to anatomy. You uh, have published books, you've written papers, you've really made huge changes in the field. Um, in particular, you have brought to the forefront, the importance of forensic anthropology and its link to anatomy. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Oh my goodness me. Uh, the wonderful thing about growing old is that you have that ability to stop and to turn around and to look at the path that you've taken. So you can see all those crossroads where you made decisions. And I was doing that fairly recently actually, and looked back and I, I was very lucky. I absolutely adored my father and any opportunity I had with my father I would be with him trailing along behind him whether he wanted me there or not and my father used to shoot so he would shoot rabbits or pigeons or whatever and my mother would always cook them so I would go out with my father at the age of five or so and bring home you know carry home the rabbits or whatever and my mother was a bit squeamish so I would sit at the back door with my father and he taught me how to skin a rabbit, how to pluck a pheasant, how to what we call grill a deer. And so from a very young age, that whole concept of, of death and the learning about anatomy really just felt like second nature. So when I was 12, which is a, a classic Scottish Presbyterian approach, my father said to me, what job are you going to get? And I thought he meant when, when I was grown up, he meant 12. At 12, what job are you going to get? because it's your responsibility to give half your earnings to your mother for board and lodging. And so I got a job in a butcher shop. So I went from the back door with my father to the butcher shop, spent the entirety of my teenage years in the butcher shop. And when I went to university, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my first two years for me were, they were really rather disappointing because I was doing subjects that just didn't capture me. And it was when I was looking to specialise in my third year 
I went to two academic departments. I went to the botany department first and bless his heart, but he was the most boring man on the planet. He really was. And I thought I can't possibly do that. A really important subject. Trust me, I know that, but it just shows the influence of, of a teacher. And I thought, well, I don't want to be like him, so I'm not going to be a botanist. And the other was an anatomist. And what she said to me was, you go into the dissecting room in your third year and you're given a body and your job is to dissect. And I thought I, I can do that because that's like the butcher shop in some ways, the different animal, but it's skills with the blade, it's skills of understanding muscle and bone and ligament and tendon. And I thought I, I can do that. And I can clearly remember in my third year walking into the dissecting room for the first time and feeling at that threshold that that was my Rubicon. And once I crossed it, I knew I couldn't go back. And I walked into a room where I felt I belonged. And I think when you can find in your heart that place where you belong, when you move into it, you know it because you feel it. It hits you in the heart. It hits you in the head. And I, the, the best year of my life was spent third year in anatomy. And we had, we had no classes as such. You were given a textbook. You were given a dissecting um, scroll with instruments and told, get on with it. And so no direction, it was this, this total investigation of this person. And it set up in me as well a huge responsibility that I think anatomists understand when you dissect, is that the person in front of you gave permission for you to do what you're going to do. They want nothing yeah. from it other than to ensure that people learn. And that's a tremendous weight of responsibility. So he taught me, my silent teacher, he taught me about dignity and decency and respect. And I knew that not only did that fit in my academic brain, it fitted in my heart and it fitted in my soul as well. So I'm always going to be an anatomist. Whatever else I do in life, at my core, in my own anatomy, I am an anatomist and hugely proud to be it. And some of you once said, you know, you have these, these um, situations where people say, who would you most like to have dinner with? And I am such a geek in terms of anatomy. It's got to be Vesalius. I wouldn't have dinner with anyone other than Vesalius if I got the chance. You know, wouldn't it be marvellous to know the politics surrounding the situations he went through to gain access to the cadavers to, to create that beautiful textbook that he did? So I came home on the day I walked into a dissecting room, I came home. But I knew at that time that research and anatomy was not something that, that really garnered much support. Yeah. And I have a pathological fear of rodents. So I cannot be anywhere around mice and rats and hamsters and things, alive or dead, it's just a no. And all the research projects were based on animal models. And so I had to go around the department to find somebody who would take me on in something different. And I found my supervisor who said, well, why don't we look at human identification from fragmented skeletal remains? And I thought, yeah, I, I can do that. I like the idea of using my anatomy to take it into another subject where I can actually address modern day problems and provide some solutions. So it just fitted into my feeling of this is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a traditional academic where you, you either taught or you had a piece of research. I wanted to do something out there in the real world. And then I was very fortunate um, that a case came into the department. Now, you've got to bear in mind, I'm so old that these were in the days before DNA was being used in forensic investigations. And we had a young man who crashed his microlite pilot off the east coast of Scotland. And his body was washed ashore you know, about two or three weeks later. And so he wasn't in a very good state of, of he was in a fairly advanced state of decomposition. And the, the question of the police was, is this the missing person? Now, there was a huge amount of damage to, to the head region and to the, the hands. So you couldn't recognize the person from their face. The teeth had also been damaged to the front of the face. We think it was by a passing boat. And the, the hands and the fits on the fingers had sloughed away as well. So all the traditional methods we had of identification at that time, which were fingerprints and dental and facial, we couldn't do, which is why the police came to the anatomy department. And they wanted us to be able to look at those remains and do the classic four things that say, is this male or female? So what's the sex of the individual? How old were they when they died? How tall were they? And what was their ethnic background? And so just being able to create those, those four 
allowed them to have some confirmation that it, it agreed with the missing person that they were looking for. But what was really interesting was the one thing that we did notice was that the gentleman in question had a birthmark just below his left nipple. And when the police spoke to his mother, he said, that's not my son. My son was perfect. My son had no skin blemishes. And then we spoke to his girlfriend and his girlfriend said, oh, yeah, yeah, he's got a birthmark just underneath his left nipple. So, you know, it's really important in identification that you speak to the people that will know the person best. And so on the basis of our, our identification, the procurator fiscal we have, which is the equivalent of a coroner, was prepared to release the body back as being the named individual. Of course, now we do DNA and there'd be no doubt. But the result of it was, and this is what sort of set up for me that, that real sort of interesting conundrum, is that his girlfriend accepted without, without doubt, any doubt that it was her boyfriend's body. The mother never, ever accepted it was her son because of the birthmark issue. And there is a part of, of human nature that in some individuals wants desperately to acknowledge that it is the person, but equally there's a sector that desperately doesn't want to, to have any recognition that it could be the possible outcome. And from that point forward, I was hooked that said, I can use my anatomy to help solve modern day problems for people who are at their most vulnerable and at their, their lowest level of grief, that you're bringing a story to them and a realization to them that is not good news. It's never good news, but it is honest and it allows them hopefully to move forward in their life. So, you know, by that point, forensically, I was, I was hooked. This, this is what anatomy, for me, what it allowed me to do. And I felt it a very honored position to do that. I'm sorry I talk too much, and I know I do. <laughs> Not at all. What a beautiful story about the human body and how attached we are to the bodies of the people we love. Um, and uh, I can really feel the, the mother's grief of not wanting that to be the body of her son. Um, and I, I mean, I think a lot of people can sympathize with her. Um, I think you can. And, and I know yeah. that, you know, when we talk to families of missing people, they often talk about their own lives going into a stutter because they remain at that point when that person went missing and they can't move beyond it because they have all the imaginings of what might have happened when they don't know the reality of what actually did happen. So when we come back, it brings that awful word, which I don't like, which is closure, but it, but it does help an acceptance that you know there is no hope left, there is only the reality and you have to make the best that you can out of the reality. I'm wondering about the other, part. maybe it's really not an extreme. Um, and this comes from one of the stories, your stories that I, I listened to uh, on YouTube um, about the family in the Baltics um, that were uh, involved in the, um, in the atrocity uh, committed by uh, Milosevic and, and, and the other, um, and how the, the father desperately, desperately wanted to identify each and every member of his yeah. family, um, just simply anything that you could get. And, and so th to me, that 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 almost is the other extreme where the other the person is not saying, I need the entire person intact, whatever you can get of of, of them, you know, I would I would like to, yeah. to have them, to honor them. And 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 it, it ties in into Something that is, you know, it's body, but then it's also metaphysical and it's also soul. And, and do you have any comments about that? I mean, it was an exceptional case. And I think if anybody asks me, which is the case where you felt you were in the right place at the right time? It was that one. I mean, it was just, it was the most heartbreaking case um, of any that I've ever done. And it was, as you say, a family in the Balkans who came out of the, the town to live in the hills because they thought they'd be safer. And they traveled down into the village to, to buy provisions. And on one occasion, a rocket propelled grenade took out the trailer that the family were traveling on. And it killed um, the wife, the wife's sister, the wife's mother, and eight children. And the eight children ranged from just a, a baby of a few months to, to two 14 year old twin boys. But father was driving the tractor and he was snipered in the leg. So he managed to get off the tractor and crawl away into the undergrowth. But he knew that if he came out, he'd be shot. 
So he had to stay there. He knew his family were all dead because of the, the nature of the explosion. He knew there was no survivor. But what I thought was just so exceptional and, you know, the test of a person is what they do in the heat of the moment in many ways, that he decided he could not leave his family exposed in that way because there were packs of dogs and they would use his family as a food source. So under cover of darkness, he, he dug a big hole and he moved around to find all the bits that he could that remained of his family. I mean, how do you do that in your head? You find a limb that belongs to a child or you find, we only ever found the bottom half of his 12 year old daughter. You know, how do you manage that and keep your own mental health, you know, intact? And so he placed them all in this, this hole in the ground next to a tree so that he knew where they were in the future. And because we came along to say, we want to, to exhume the bodies for the indictment. And he was very willing because he said his biggest fear was that his God could not find his family because they were all jumbled up together. And what he needed was the certainty that each and every member of his family was represented. I think part of it was well was about himself, the fear that he might have missed one of his family members, I suspect. And so when we exhumed the, the body, the hole in the ground, we had enough to fill one and a half body bags. You know, that there wasn't that amount of material. And so in the mortuary, I laid out 12 white sheets because we knew we had 11 people missing and we knew that there would be a remnant of material that we simply couldn't attribute. And because this is a, a war indictment, we knew we were going to court. And so we have to be certain that if we assign an identity to a body or a part of a body, we have to be certain because we're going to give evidence on that in court. And if a defence lawyer says, right, we're going to exhume that body bag. And if what's in there is not who you say, then you're not a credible witness and everything you do will be thrown out. So, so you have to be very rigorous. And we were able to find parts of all of the bodies that we were content um, belong to that individual. And of course, at that point, I was writing the textbook, Developmental Juvenile Osteology which was about identifying the remains of children. So I couldn't have been in a better place at that time. And my co-author, Louise Shaw, was on the end of a phone with me. So if I needed any advice, saying, what does that look like in a five-year-old? You know, she'd go away and she'd check the bits of paper and, and keep me right. So, uh, you know, we had that perfect partnership while we were going through it. But we got to the two 14-year-old um, twin boys and of course, nothing was going to separate them for us. They were both male. They were the same age. DNA wouldn't help us because all DNA was just familial DNA. We knew it was family. But one of them, we only ever had the top part of their bodies. So we only ever had the, the shoulders and the upper part of the pectoral girdle. And one of them was attached to a Mickey Mouse vest. And I said to the police, go and ask dad which of his children had a Mickey Mouse vest. Don't say which of the twin boys just ask which child. And he came back and he named one of the twins who had apparently had an absolute obsession with Mickey Mouse. And so that allowed us to also separate the two twin boys. And when we handed the body bags back to them, it was just the most surreal experience ever. You have a man standing there who has lost everything, all of his family, his wife and all of his children. And you're handing back these meager little bags sometimes with only one or two bones in it. And his gratitude was just overwhelming. And you feel embarrassed. You don't quite know how to respond to it because you think, how can somebody who has gone through that amount of personal trauma still have the dignity and the presence of mind to thank the teams that are trying to bring his family together? And, but he went away with 12 body bags, fully accepting but in one body bag, there were remnants of, of many members because we simply couldn't assign them reliably. But that didn't matter for him because he could bury all 11. And as we handed each one over to him, we relayed to him the name of the person who was in there. And so he could take off in his mind, yes, he had recovered something of all of his family. And now his God could find every single one of them. And that was all he asked of from us. Yeah, that's just for me. It was such a moment where 
we think there are some things in life that are important and there are some things that just aren't. And so, you know, I don't care if I don't vacuum the floor. I don't care if I have a scratch on my car. I really don't care. But I cared every single night that I went home and I hugged my children and I held them tight. So they knew they were loved, they knew they were cared for because those kind of situations teach you what is important to be human. Thank you for that story. And I'm really struck by the connection of our humanity with our bodies. And I, they're so interlinked. I mean, we know that our human form determines our, you know, what we can do, what, how we walk and act on this planet, um, but also how attached we are to, to bodies. It, you know, we often talk about um, things like love as, you know, we have a soulmate as if it was some sort of ethereal connection, but it is a bodily connection and um, not just in a romantic sense, but also it's a very bodily connection to the people who are our friends and our, our extended family. We, we hug each other, we, we touch each other's bodies and we have this attachment to the body. And I think you've been in, um, from what you're saying, it, in a very privileged position to to bring those bodies back together and to um, and to help people in, in that grief. Um, very inspirational. There, you've um, made a huge difference in individual people's lives, um, and you've also done some work um, to move the field forward by. Um, I want to talk about your work on the human hand. I find that is so fascinating what you've done there. Tell us how you got into that and um, your journey from sort of this idea to having it accepted in court. I've already given a little bit away there. It will yeah, end in court. <laughs> okay. Um, you often find in forensic investigations and forensic research that it's a case that, that comes forward with a question and you don't have the answer. So that's what initiates the research. That's what research is about. It's about unanswered questions. And so the police came forward. It was actually linked to Kosovo because the photographer in question from the police force I had served with in Kosovo. And so he had a problem and he thought, I don't know who to ask, but I know, I'll go and ask Sue. Not in my field at all, but sometimes I feel like I'm at the bottom of the barrel. You know, when people are scraping the bottom of the barrel, we'll go and ask Sue because maybe she'll know somebody. And they had a case that came into them. And it was a young girl who alleged, young teenage girl, who alleged that her father came into her bedroom at night and sexually abused her. And she told her mother and her mother didn't believe her. So what the young girl did was she put on her camera on her computer and left it running at night. And when you do that, your camera at night flicks into infrared mode. And so what you can do is you can see in the dark. And so at half past four in the morning, we have captured on video a hand and a forearm coming into the field of vision, doing exactly what the young girl said was happening to her. She then took those images to the police and all the police had was her testimony that this was her father that was doing it, and this hand and forearm. She never saw a face, she never saw anything else. And so the photographer phoned me up and said, look, we've had this case rattling around inside the Metropolitan Police now for weeks. We don't know what to do with it. Is there anything you can do? And I said, well, I have no idea. I need to see it, first of all. And of course, because it was infrared light, um, when infrared light interacts with the skin, the deoxygenated blood in your veins. Your veins stand out like black tram lines. So I could see the superficial vein pattern on the back of the hand and into the forearm. And what I said to the police was, what we know in anatomy is that there's no vein that is constant in the upper limb, more distal than the one that's going to appear in the antecubital fossa. Everything below that doesn't have a constant name because it's not in a constant position. And my friend Vesalius knew that from the 1500s and before, that we know that veins, the V in veins, stands for variable, because the further away you are from the heart, the more variable is the arborescent pattern where these, these um, developing blood vessels come together. So I said, what I can tell you is, 
If we compare the vein pattern in the offender and we compare the vein pattern in dad, if they don't match, I can tell you it's absolutely not him because you don't grow a new vein system. If they do match, I have no idea what that means because I don't know or I didn't know at that point what the likelihood was of different vein patterns. I just know veins are variable. And I know in the dissecting room that we can we can pull back the skin on the, the right hand and pull back the skin on the left hand and we won't see the same vein pattern. But I can't tell you any more than that. And they said, okay, well, let me go and talk to the Crown Prosecution Service and let's see what happens. And the lawyers came out with a term that should turn every expert witness's blood to ice was they said, well, let's take a punt, they said. Now, as an expert witness, you don't want to be the one on whom they're taking a punt in the courtroom. But so we went into the courtroom and um, when we'd done the comparison, we could see that it matched dad's veins perfectly. So we went into the courtroom and um, the judge called a wadir, which means you get rid of the jury and the judge needs to decide whether the evidence that's come forward is has a scientific basis to it or whether it's witchcraft fundamentally and uh, an act of fiction. And so I gave him my evidence. I talked about the salius. Of course I did. I got the salius into the courtroom. Um, I talked about variation in vein patterns. I talked about the fact that now in the biometrics world, we use vein patterns as a means of identification. So vein patterns, uh, readers in the finger, for example, are used to give you access into high security areas such as banks. So I could show that the anatomy tells us this, modern day research tells us this. Here's the first time we've tried to pull it together into a forensic image. And the judge, God bless him, said, actually, you know, this is based on anatomy. And anatomy has uh, a really credible long-term reputation as a subject that is to be trusted and believed. So the evidence was given in court, which I thought was a, a really good thing. So the jury went away and the jury came back and found dad not guilty. And that really surprised me because I thought, who else was in her room at half past four in the morning doing exactly what she said was happening to her with an identical vein pattern? And I asked our barrister what we'd done wrong, because the classic thing is you blame yourself. What did I do wrong? Could I have done more? She said, no, 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 she said, your, your, your evidence was absolutely fine. They simply didn't believe the girl. She didn't break down and cry. And I thought, you know, if the fact that you don't cry is what decides justice, there's something wrong. This was a young teenage girl who her mother had disbelieved her, who had put herself through the abuse again so that she could record it and had had the incredible courage to take it to the police and to take her father to court. And I thought, you know, for a young girl, that is truly courageous. And then for a courtroom to say, we don't believe you, that really for us was a moment where we thought, okay, science didn't help her that day, and, but it can. And the police said to us, we're seeing more and more of these cases, so we need to be able to work on this. I don't know what happened to the girl. Um, I know her name. Nobody else does. If she ever came forward, and I tell the story a lot, to say, actually, that was me. This is my name. I would know who it was. Because, And it's important to me because as a scientist, I couldn't help her that day because the science wasn't at a level where the jury were prepared to believe it. Um, but what she's done since then is really the legacy of our research. So we've helped to secure well over 30 life sentences, well over 500 years of prison sentencing for child sexual abuse. That's her legacy because she was so brave to bring this forward. We just had that research opportunity. So we, we find ourselves where we needed a database and it just so happened that I was training police officers in Dundee at the time. And I had 500 police officers who were all prepared to strip to their underwear and allow me to photograph them and to photograph their veins in their hands, their forearms and their arms, their feet, their, th their legs and their thighs. We never touched torso, we never touched faces. Um, and they willingly gave us those images that we recovered both in visible light and in infrared light. And it allowed us to start to do the research that said how common now is a pattern. And of course, it's not just veins. You look at the back of your, your right hand and you look at the back of your left hand, 
you can see the vein pattern will be different between your right and your left. They'll be different if you're an identical twin. If you look at the pattern of skin creases across the knuckles, they're different on every finger. They're different across both hands. They're not the same as anybody else in your family. These are all individualistic. And when you start to layer them one on top of the other, they all form from different etiologies. So the vein pattern is caused by the vacuum that is set up by the second beat of the heart that pulls together the little pools of blood that form in the fetus and help to create them into a venous system. If you look at the skin creases on the knuckles, they're formed when the interzones with the joints are formed in the fetus. And they are simply an expression of skin extension, uh, flexion and extension to give you that stretching. Totally different etiology, but it's understanding anatomy. And if you look at, for example, the freckles on the back of your hand, if you're a redhead, or if you have birthmarks, or you know, you're getting on a bit and you have liver spots, whatever the punctate pigmentation pattern looks like, they're different in everybody as well. And so in, a, in an image of a hand, we don't know which anatomical features we'll see. So we have to be able to understand the variation in them all. And when you think that what we have to do in the forensic world is to look at these images, not just still images, sometimes video of child sexual abuse. It is something that does harm to everybody. So just having to look at these images has an impact, whether you're a police officer, whether you're a scientist, because those images do never leave you. And so we've decided in, in our current research that we're going to train the computer to do our work because hopefully the computer will not have the same issues that we have in that it's not going to suffer from post-traumatic stress because it's looking, it's not looking at the images in the same way that we are. And some people have said that the work that we do are, are, are as if we're the modern day sin eaters, those who eat the sins of the world so nobody else has to be able to see them. If we can now train a computer to look through the video, to extract the pictures of the hands, because it's a contact crime in many ways. And the part of the body most frequently presented in these images is the back of the hand. And if the computer can find the images, extract the image, you don't have to see everything else that's going on around it. And then once the computer has the image of the hand, it can extract the vein pattern. It can extract the knuckle crease pattern. It can extract the, the punctate pigmentation and it can start to create an algorithm. And that multimodal algorithm, we can then use in any police force around the world so that we don't have to train the experts to do it anymore. We can train the computer to do it. And it's so such a weight of the experts to not have to look at these indecent images. And for us to also be able to use now databases of vast numbers. So Lancaster now has the largest hands database in the world. And once we, we've got these computers properly trained to identify everything, we can run these images through them at a rate of knots, increase the statistical probability of the matching just you know, to such an extent that I was in discussion the other day about whether I could be doing myself out of a job. And I'm sure I am, and I'd be delighted to be done out of a job. Because if, if the algorithms and the computers can do it all, then you just need to go into the courtroom to be able to say, here's the findings. The computer says there's a 98% match. And if, if we're at that level, we're talking about DNA. You know, the, the level of identification is comparable. And given the fact that we can separate identical twins, actually, in some ways, one could argue, perhaps could make it even that little bit more specific. But it's all down to anatomy. And it's all down to that incredibly brave young woman all those years ago. Again, it's um, such a fascinating story, bringing together, the, again, the, the human body mm -hmm. and something that anatomists um, do so well linking it to development and embryology, linking the surface anatomy and levering, leveraging technology to support what we're doing. Um, I always, when I look at the history of anatomy and you know, um, 
the visualizations that we've seen in anatomy, mm -hmm. I always am struck by how anatomy textbooks were so forward thinking in their illustrations. They were the first ones to have like these little flaps that you could lift so you could see the layering of things. So I feel like anatomists have always been these innovative thinkers um, to really um, bring that science forward and to communicate it in an effective way, leveraging the technology and leveraging um, their imagination. And I find this is another case where all of those things come together so beautifully to really um, help people, right? Which is, I think, Can you at, talk at the basis of this. You know, forensic anthropology, often you'll find that university courses will teach osteology, not really forensic anthropology, you teach the bones. But yeah. as an anatomist, I can't look at the bones in isolation. They're, they're part of different systems. You know, I need to know what those muscles look like. I need to know the nerve that supplies those muscles. I need to know where the blood supply is coming from. I can't understand the bone till I understand all the forces that are working around it. And so, you know, in Dundee, when we set up the forensic anthropology course, what I said to all of my students was, we need to make you anatomists, first of all. So they all went through the third year dissection that says, understand what death means, understand the importance of dissection and detail, and get all of that anatomy under your belt. Not just the gross anatomy, but you're absolutely right, the neuroanatomy, the histology, all of the embryology, None of it is in isolation. It's all that integral part of the person who is growing and forming. And you can't get the holistic picture until you've seen it from, from all the different lenses. And then when I said, and once we've got you as an anatomist, then, you know, there's a world shortage of gross anatomists, let's face it. You'll always get a job in anatomy somewhere. Take your forensic skills with you. Don't become a forensic something, first of all. Become a scientist, first of all, become an anatomist, first of all, and then apply those to a real world situation, whether that's applying anatomy into embryology or into forensic or something else. It is anatomy is the great translatable science. It really is. You can tell I kind of like the subject. Absolutely, I <laughs> know. And, you know, I could listen to you for hours and hours and hours. Oh, no, you couldn't <laughs> trust me. <laughs> my husband certainly doesn't say that. <laughs> um, what you said last just reminded me about how anatomy, teaching and learning anatomy is changing. And it's changing um, especially in North America where we are because... Um, there's a lot of focus on integration of anatomy with other subjects and reduction of dissection hours. In fact, elimination of dissection altogether in some programs. And we are fortunate, very fortunate here at UBC that we insist on keeping our dissection program and mm -hmm. our donation program. And and I and I am almost. I almost think I know what your answer is going to be now when, if I ask you. And, but the question is, um, what's your view about all these ancillary ways of teaching and learning anatomy, pro-section, and then even into now 3D imaging and in, now into um, um, just using other models and so on? Um, um, we think that you quite don't get the same knowledge and experience of anatomy, but I wanted to ask you what you thought. So if I was being the purist, I absolutely support everything that you, you said. Um, there is no real substitute for dissection because dissection requires time and time allows you to think. And there is no substitute to touching and to feeling. It's not until you've held the, sci the sciatic nerve in your hand and thought, goodness me, look at the size of that. You know, it doesn't look that big in a book, but when you hold it, you know, that, that really does sort of lodge with you. So in an ideal world, and, and I certainly said this when I was at Dundee, I would never teach in an anatomy department that does not have full body dissection. So I laid my stall out very, very early on. Um, and, and I, I stuck to that whilst I was at Dundee, but I think you also have to be pragmatic. And the pragmatism says that there's no doubt that 30, 50 years ago, we probably taught too much 
detailed anatomy to our undergraduate students who only had a, a year and not even a year in which to do it. You know, does anybody remember the afferent and efferents of the otic ganglion? Unless they're an anatomist. Yeah, I know, unless they're an anatomist. But, you know, is there a student who's gone through in one year that can tell you about the, no, of course they can't. That level of detail comes later in some ways. So if you have a limited resource, and let's face it, anatomy dissection programs are expensive. It is an expensive means of learning. I think it's the best way to learn, but it is an expensive means. And if you are going to reduce that, then I think you have to retain the parts that you need for where it's most required. Now, what I mean by that is if you're training surgeons, they need to learn the anatomy. They need to be able to touch it, to feel it, to cut, to see the approach. Doing it 3D um, on whether it's a virtual handset, a virtual set, whether it's about being on models or computers, just doesn't have the same feel at all. And they need that. So I, I think in all honesty, we probably taught too much detailed anatomy in the past for the needs of our students. But when our students change, that is, they're into master's levels, they're into surgical um, development, then they need the detail. And I don't think there's any substitute then for anatomy and body dissection. But what we did at Dundee was that um, we were starting to see the surgeons coming back to say the formaldehyde, the formalin embalmed cadavers just weren't realistic enough. They were too stiff and they, they weren't, you know, in, they, they didn't have the same feel or mobility of a patient. And so we brought in some legislation in the UK that allowed us to use something that's called fresh frozen, which I really don't like, um, but that's a personal thing. And that is the body comes in, it's separated into pieces, it's frozen. And that body part is then taken out of the freezer, it's defrosted, it is then worked on, but fundamentally then that, that piece of body has no longer any purpose because once it's defrosted, you can't freeze it again, it has a limited time. And so we went out and we went to speak, speak to the most marvellous man called Walter Thiel in Graz in Austria, and he had developed the Thiel approach to soft embalming. And we went out to talk to him to say, what are the benefits? What are, what are the, the pitfalls? And we could only find benefits. We couldn't find pitfalls. And we said, right, we're, we're going to have a go. We are going to teal and balm two bodies. And so we were given permission by the university and we were given permission by the donors. So we spoke to donors to say, you know, because they were signing up to us, people who knew they didn't have long left. We said, would you be willing for us to do this? And it's just the spirit of people who donate. They went, absolutely, you know, pioneers in their own way. And so we teal and bound these two bodies and we brought in all of our surgeons from all of the different disciplines, starting with the disciplines that make minimum amount of damage to those that go on and make maximum amount of damage. And we asked them to feed back on us whether this was a better approach or not. And absolutely to a person, they said, this feels like a patient. The only difference is it's cold and it doesn't have a pulse. But other than that, the tissues behave. And you can insufflate the bodies. You know, we could link the bodies up to respirators and you could see the chest rising and falling because it's a soft fix method. Put the living daylight out of me because I've never seen a cadaver do that before. I have to say it takes a bit of getting used to. But that was the point at which we decided we were going to abandon using formalin as a method of preservation and adopt the teal approach. And we've never, we've never looked back since in Dundee since that point. And it's become such a valuable teaching method, not just for surgeons who are learning, but surgeons who are coming saying, we need to try a new approach. We want to try a new implant, whatever it may be. They now can place the body into the position that they would place a patient into so that they can actually practice the procedures. And that just opened up such a world for us in terms of moving anatomy forward. Yeah, the teal embalming is amazing. I mean, it's very fussy. I remember the first paper came out in German and I was tasked with translating it into English for UBC actually. And uh, they tried it, but it was, um, they didn't have the facilities um, to uh, to do it because it requires immersion, I think. In, in it does, it's, it's immersion. Yeah. Um, yeah. What we, I mean, you know, 
this, this is sort of fairly typical, I'm afraid, of the Brits. But what we found is we, we had a couple of water tanks that were being removed from one of our biology departments, so we commandeered them. And so we used these two water tanks to be able to submerge the bodies into and just watched over the weeks how the bodies changed because we really didn't know how it was going to change. And, and you know, it still retained its colour. And we felt, oh, gosh, you know, it can't be properly embalmed if, it, if the muscles still look red. And of course, they were. It was incredible. But what I did was I used it as a means at the university to say, OK, if we're going to adopt this, and I think we should, then we need a new mortuary. And that was a really good excuse to get rid of our old mortuary and to build a new one. And we, we sort of did a, a costing exercise and we decided we needed two million pounds. And the university said, OK, we'll give you a million. You need to go and raise the other million. How do you raise a million pounds to, to build a mortuary? You know, you can't stand outside the supermarket with a bucket, you know, rattling at people, can you? So, I can, oh, my gosh, that image of you standing in front of a supermarket yeah, with a yeah, cup asking that. for. Yeah, no, <laughs> really, really bad taste. So what we did is we decided if we're going to build a mortuary, who would want a mortuary named after them? And we decided that crime writers would. So we got 10 crime writers together and they all competed against each other, raising money. Um, so that the person who raised the most money, we would name the mortuary after. And so our campaign was called Million for a Morgue. And, and we raised the funds that we needed to build the new mortuary. Now, we told the university we needed two million. We didn't actually, was the truth. But you never, ever tell the university what the real cost of anything is. So we only really had to raise half a million, which we did. Um, if I told them it was going to cost a million and a half, they wouldn't have given me a million. Um, so, but we were able to put the new mortuary together. So we have these amazing submersion tanks um, that hold four bodies at a time, each in an individual cage. And because of the crime writers that we had, we named each tank after the crime writer. So, you know, we have the Val McDermott tank and we have um, Lee Child said it wouldn't be appropriate if he won the competition because we'd have to call it the child mortuary, which is not good. And so he allowed us to call it Jack Reacher. So we, have a, we had a Jack Reacher tank um, in the mortuary. But all of these things are about getting across to the public that bodies are still needed for donation. And so I'd go out and do public events and my poor bequeathal secretary on a Monday morning would go, where were you over the weekend? What were you doing? My phone is red hot with people phoning to say, how do I bequeath my body? And we saw an absolute resurgence of body donation because people didn't know it was needed. And people, you know, when they get to that point in their life, they want to talk about death. And anatomists can talk very comfortably with people about the actual facts of death and dying without any platitudes, without, you know, soft, soft words spoken at a, dif a distance. It is about the honesty and the reality of the subject. So for me, they, they all just came together beautifully. I was just so lucky. Amazing. Well, we are rounding up our discussion with you today. I told you I talked far too much. <laughs> and one of the things we do ask our guests, um, uh, kind of ask everybody is in terms of, their favorite body part, if they have any particular part of their body that is that is a favorite part and why? Uh, and, and as well as the opposite, is their least favorite part and why? Okay, can I have two favorites? Okay, yes. so I'll be, I'll be very quick because they're both bones. Uh, the first is the clavicle. What a beautiful bone the clavicle is. We don't need it, we can remove it. Providing we stitch the muscles together, we don't need it. So it's totally superfluous. But it's the first bone to form and it's the last one to finish growing. That's that's a that's a real thing. It's shaped like a Roman key, the clavicula, which is where it gets its name from. And so I, I just love it for the fact it's got the real cheek of being the first bone to form and then just holds out to the end and outstrips everybody else in its growth. So I just love it just for its sheer bare-faced nonsense because we don't actually need it in the first place. The second one that I really like is, is in the, the petrous part of the temporal, the bone that forms around the inner ear. So the bone that forms from the otic capsule, because that bit of bone is laid down when you're growing inside mum and it doesn't remodel because it can't. The, the inner ear has got to be formed at the size that's going to be 
for the rest of your life. So when you're, you're, you're born, your inner ear is the size it's going to be and the bone doesn't remodel. So if we analyze the composition of the bone surrounding the otic capsule, the isotopic signature of that bone represents what your mother was eating when she was pregnant with you. So I love the concept that for the rest of your life, your mother sits inside your head. It's so true for my mother, but it happens metaphorically as well as physically. So my, my thumbs are up to the otic capsule, I have to say. It, it's the best. So is and this why I hear my mom's voice in my I, head all the time? And, and yep. exactly what I always okay. feel my mother is in my ear. And when I open my mouth, my father falls out. So you know, your parents are permanently inside you. It doesn't go away. You become your parents if you live long enough. Um, but I don't have a part of the body that I dislike because every part of it, if it doesn't have a reason today, it has a reason in the past. Even though, you know, it's something like, you know, the um, Palmaris brevis or whatever it may be that not everybody's got. Just the very fact that it's variable is, is wonderful. But it isn't a part of the human body to dislike. It is the most marvellous, absolutely marvellous construction. And what a, a real honour we have as anatomists to be given that opportunity by somebody to look inside them. You know, it, what, what's not to love? I just think we are so incredibly fortunate. What beautiful final words. Thank you so much. And I agree, we are so fortunate to um, be studying and teaching about the human body. And um, I think all of us humans are fortunate to have these beautiful bodies um, and to love other human bodies um, all around us. Thank you so much for sharing your passion and your compassion and your uh, views onto the body and your absolutely inspiring stories of how you've made a real difference in people's lives. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.